okay into it so what do we remember from here english indian english is different okay if we uh, look closely at it indian english is different from english in india the it was not that the you know the the use or the introduction of english in india came about only in the 18th century or in in, uh, uh, in the 19th century uh, henrik mario nin in his book english in india points to the date 1600 in fact the last uh, day of uh, you know um, uh, 1600 and says that the granting uh, you know by the crown uh, of england of the charter to the merchants to deal with the east and eventually the east india company uh, it really should be um, should be the correct date okay for when we, to talk about the beginnings of english in india or the english language in india okay so 1600 is it is is the date that is set by um, by mario nin and many scholars uh, if at all we are to point to uh, you know the coming so to speak of uh, english in india okay so it came with once with once the charter was granted so it came with the company now let's go back again to braj kachru and let us uh, you know look at how he talks about the four stages okay of um, uh, of the language in india and he says that the four stages are these first when we talk about how english came into india we have to refer to the missionary efforts okay we need to refer to the christian missionaries right who who uh, on their evangelical mission okay uh, also used um, uh, you know also brought the christian ideals and the christian texts okay so the first stage kachru says is the stage of exploration and this stage of exploration was largely by the missionary and their efforts it is also uh, you know um, uh, it is all, uh, you know it is also followed the missionary effort was also followed by the missionaries themselves to learn to learn the native languages it is an error to think that the, that the christian missionaries only brought the uh, you know they they sought to spread the english language here after a certain time they realized that if in their zeal in the evangelistic zeal if they did not uh, learn the native languages themselves then uh, it would be after a point of time well near impossible to spread christianity i can give you an uh, example from assam for instance okay it is said that the first assamese dictionary was by miles bronson who was a baptist missionary okay uh, who came to spread christianity in assam so the very first dictionary of the assamese language in the northeastern part of india was not uh, by a native was in fact by uh, you know uh, by miles brunson and his colleagues who very successfully brought out the as you know uh, the first assamese dictionary okay so it is really as i said the exploratory part as professor kachru says the exploratory part must be uh, you know um, it must be realized that the, the christian missionaries were responsible okay for bringing in english and at the, and later on to switching so uh, as it were to the native languages then kachru says that the next phase is the phase of implementation right in the phase of implementation he famously refers to uh, macaulay's minute on uh, education macaulay's minute on education that was submitted uh, to the government was uh, uh, you know uh, is considered a famous or an infamous if you will um, you know uh, minute on education where he laid out the policies and the strategies behind the need for english education uh, or you know to cultivate as he calls you know uh, a, a, you know a group of people who would be who would be uh, you know who would be indian in color but in taste they were to be raised as um, as uh, raised as englishmen the idea here was to introduce the english language as well as uh, into education as well as create a class of you know uh, people who were called the babus for instance who would play important part in and uh, at the clerical uh, clerical level okay in british administration so they would then need to be uh, uh, to be uh, trained in the english language and in certain values of christianity and 
uh, uh, Western life. So, the, f the third uh, phase as mentioned by Professor Kachru is a phase of diffusion, uh, where he says that the, the British control uh, was, was paramount and the diffusion of English language uh, grew to a great extent during this time and finally, is the implementation, okay. the implementation of all the educational strategies and policies that were, uh, had, they were hitherto being um, uh, forwarded by various, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, by, by various bureaucrats in the British government. Okay. So, what then are the four stages? The four stages are A, the exploratory stage begin with the beginning with the missionaries, then was the phase of um, implementation, uh, you know, coming with Macaulay's famous minute of 1835, followed by the diffusion phase of diffusion of British control and finally, of implementation of their policy. So, this is how the growth the beginning and growth of English in India is to be seen uh, along with socio political and, and uh, socio political and, and evangelist developments. Okay. Now, a, a very important scholar here uh, in uh, you know in the delineation of English uh, studies really of um, you know the, the political imperatives behind English in India has been a scholar named Gauri Vishwanathan. Now, some of you may be aware or um, uh, you know the name, name may be familiar to you particularly her um, a doctoral dissertation I think which went on to be published as Masks, Masks of Conquest. Okay. So, Gauri Vishwanathan's book is one that I would uh, recommend to you okay, uh, to be read if you have to, if you really have to understand the policies and strategies behind you know the introduction in this case of uh, not just the English language, but of the literary study in India. Okay. Now, you would be surprised to know if you do not know uh, already that uh, the study of the, lit the study of literature okay, as a discipline was uh, uh, or the study of English literature as a discipline was not something that came uh, the, was not something that began in England. Okay. Uh, the, the study of rhetoric was very important at the university so say of say Cambridge for, for instance. Okay. Uh, the study of philology, the study of language, the study of rhetoric, these were the disciplines that were being taught. Okay. Surprisingly, English literature as a discipline was introduced in India first before it was introduced in England. So, uh, so uh, one may raise this question, what was the need? Okay. What, what is this anomaly here that the literature of a certain country is first taught uh, uh, you know uh, or first forwarded as part of the curriculum okay, in, a colon, uh, in a colonized country. Right. So, Vishwanathan very, very beautifully, very successfully brings out uh, what was behind the scenes okay, or what the policies were of these. And I am now going to quickly read from Masks of Conquest and uh, the, the, theor the theoretical Im, you know, impetus comes uh, from the, the, the concept of hegemony that was given to us by the, the Italian Marxist scholar uh, Antonio Gramsci. Okay. Uh, hegemony is uh, according to Gramsci not something uh, not something that is necessarily imposed on us. Okay. Hegemony is hegemony is something that we can the person who is on whom it is imposed may also very willingly adhere to. Okay. So, she says here cultural domination works by consent. Now, this, this is the important point. Okay. So, domination is usually understood as an act of power and act of coercion. Okay. So, following Gramsci, Vishwanathan says that cultural domination does not have to be you know only one of power an act of power. Cultural domination works by consent and can and often does precede conquest by force. Power operating concurrently at two clearly distinguishable levels produces a situation and uh, she refers to Gramsci here, where Gramsci writes the supremacy of a social group manifests itself in two ways as domination and as intellectual and moral leadership. 
Okay, so there are two two sides to hegemony. One is the usually understood in the usually understood understood sense of domination, but also in the guise of leadership of intellectual and and, and particularly moral, uh, you know, uh, leadership. This hegemony may in fact be consented to. Okay, by those who are dominated, because it is seen as something that is desirable. In, in fact, in, uh, uh, because it is a desire, sometimes even created, okay, by those in power as something that is to be desired by the population. Okay, so let me again read this: cultural domination works by consent, and can and often does precede conquest by force. Power operating concurrently at two distinguishable uh, two clearly distinguishable levels produces a situation where Gramsci writes the supremacy of a social group manifests itself in two ways as domination and as intellectual and moral leadership. It seems clear that there can and indeed must be hegemonic activity even before the rise to power because there has to be a level of consent okay, rise to power and that one should not count only on the material force which power gives in order to exercise an effective leadership. Okay, so, this is precisely what uh, according to Gauri Vishwanathan happened in India. It was not an act of power, but it was also a, a leadership projected as something that would give one intellectual and moral upliftment. Okay. So, therefore, English was used to as some as, uh, you know as a tool or English and uh, English literary study was used as a tool. So, as Vishwanathan says to mask colonial exploitation. Okay. So, in uh, in the name uh, you know of of providing a, a quote unquote better education okay, to the native population in India, okay, what was going on was actually colonial exploitation. And the second point is in the name of stability, right. So, the two one is giving you enlightenment okay, and the second is creating uh, in a veneer so to speak of, of stability and on not just creating a veneer of stability I should say also to ensure administrative stability. Okay. So, these were the two things one masking according to Gauri Vishwanathan masking colonial exploitation and the other is to provide administrative stability in India for which the English language and English uh, uh, literature in particular was seen uh, as highly, highly desirable. Do you follow? Next, if you look at the words of Macaulay and I had referred to uh, you know to the strategies uh, of you know uh, behind the in introduction of uh, English in India, English studies. Macaulay says that we need to create a class, this is from uh, his famous minute, we need to create a class who may be that is a class from Indians, we need to create a class who may be in interpreters between us and those whom we govern. A class of persons it says Indians in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinion, in morals and in intellect. So, it was a very clear agenda really that there would be a uh, you know there would be a class created from educated Indians okay, who would be the the, uh, would be the go between so to speak. Okay. They would be interpreters between the British uh, um, uh, government and the native Indian, they would be interpreters and even though they were you know uh, they were Indian in blood, they would be really be sahibs or the brown sahibs as, as you know they were called okay, who would whose taste would be formed, whose intellectual moral. Uh, whose intellectual moral taste would be so formed, so that they are attuned, okay? They are attuned to English values and English culture. Okay, so this, uh, as Vishwanathan and several other scholars have pointed out, that this was a deliberate attempt and a deliberate strategy in the history of English in India. As scholars have pointed out, there were really, you know, you could clearly see two stages. Okay, you could clearly see two stages um, in. Uh, you know in the subject matter so to speak okay, of English in India. Now, one period is it from the from 1830 to 1850 okay, and the impetus here was on 
clearly on Christian imagery. Okay, this was the time when, as we, we noticed, the missionaries were encouraged. Okay, so the, the the impetus was on teaching Christian imagery through Christian texts, right? And a, a general English, you know, uh, to to sort of uh, to celebrate uh, English ideals and English standards, right? So this was the first phase of you know first phase behind introducing English. Um, as a language and English literary studies in uh, uh, in India, that was of uh, you know trying to to show the Christian religion as uh, a religion that was better than you know. There are so many tracks really. If you look at uh, you know uh, that were derived that would deride Hinduism, uh, call it a superstitious um, you know uh, superstitious religion, for instance, and Hindus as um, steeped in superstition. So, in the first phase we found that Christian imagery was used a lot okay, and English ideals in general, but what happened was from 1950 onwards was uh, realized that the missionaries uh, uh, you know, and uh, the, the proselytizing uh, you know, done by the missionaries were being resisted by the Indian population okay, in many pockets and it was seen as not really a de no more a desirable thing to do. In many books, in, in, in for instance, in many history uh, books on the history of missionaries in, in northeast uh, in part of India, you will also find the, you know when you look at the, the exchanges okay, of documents or so official documents between um, uh, the missionaries and the British government, uh, you will be surprised to find that you know there are um, a number of times they have been uh, you know they, they have been uh, almost at loggerheads with one another. Okay, one trying to say that it was important to proselytize, it was important to convert the population to Christianity, and the other putting a stop to it and saying that it was inimical or sometimes at odds with government policy. Okay, so then from 1850 uh, onwards, we see that impetus is more secular. Okay, than Christian. So the stance here. In, uh, of English in India was by the British government was secular in nature and where was the focus? The focus was on commerce. Okay? The focus was on commerce, uh, commercial and administrative goals. Right? So, movement, uh, moving, uh, movement away from Christian ideals of English ideals of texts on to do with Christianity and Christian imagery to a desire to educate the Indians in matters commercial and administrative. So, this is a clear policy change that we find uh, in the history of English in India. Uh, referring again quickly to Macaulay is you know how, how uh, many of the British saw their literature as being you know far, far above the literatures of India for instance. Macaulay for instance is known to have famously known to have said that uh, and I quote him, I have never found one amongst them who could deny that a single shelf, a single shelf of European library was worth the whole native literature of Asia and Arabia. So, it was again not really, it was not, not just by a matter of strategy and policy, it was also sought, you know, it was also thought to be so by the British themselves and it is also, uh, you know, uh, part of um, you know their goal to 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 show to the uh, Indians that that uh, the books or the literatures, the cultural ideals of the British were far better and superior than those of India. Therefore, if we may say that English was introduced in India as a tool first of civilization, a tool of light, a tool of enlightenment. English was used as a medium for understanding science and technology and also the industrial revolutions technological impact okay, was also one of the points that uh, we, we cannot, uh, cannot ignore here. Okay. So, the, the, the entire if you look at it the whole, the whole picture that was created was as, as you said India was not civilized and hence had to be civilized with uh, first Christian and then later on um, uh, you know science and technology, ideals of science and technology and the fruits of the industrial revolution. Okay. So, we, we also have here following the same, uh, same uh, idea, uh, some, a few words by Charles Grant for instance, okay, who said that the true curse of darkness is 
the introduction of light. The Hindus err because they are ignorant and their errors have never fairly been laid before them. The communication of our light and knowledge to them would prove the best remedy for their disorders. So, these are some of, as I said, from Macaulay, Charles Grant, etc. These are some of the ways in which they had expressed this point. In uh, Sri Lanka, then Ceylon also, in 1827, we find Sir Edward Barnes, who laid the foundation of a Christian institution, saying this to give a superior education to a number of young persons who from their ability, piety and good conduct were likely to prove fit persons in communicating a knowledge of Christianity to their countrymen. And if you look at other, uh, you know, the history of other um, colonized places, then this, a similar kind of history would definitely also also emanate. Okay? Again, the history of, of, of uh, enlightenment, a history of, uh, you know, uh, you say uh, commercial and administrative gains for instance for, you know uh, behind the spread of a language okay now the english uh, 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 reading from uh, gauri vishwanathan the english education of 1835 proposed by governor general william bentinck on macaulay's advice made england this is very important 1835 a date that we had mentioned uh, you know ago with the impl impl implementation phase was um, that the English education, remember this, the English Education Act okay, made English the medium of instruction in Indian education. This is 1835, an important date here. With the formal instit institutionalization of English as a language of instruction, the stage was set for a new direction to Indian education. Okay. But as the next chapter that is in, in uh, Vishwanathan's book will elaborate Bentinck's resolution was not as revolutionary in the introduction of a new language. The English language was already being taught in India even before 1835 as in endorsing a new function. Okay? So, it was new in the sense that it endorsed a new function and purpose for English instruction in the dissemination of moral and religious values. Okay? So, this is one of the points that has been highlighted by the author. For, uh, further again, she says, the history of education in British India shows that certain humanistic functions traditionally associated with literature, for example, the shaping of character or the development of the aesthetic sense or the disciplines of ethical thinking were considered essential to the processes of socio-political control by the guardians of the same tradition. Okay? So, along with the fact that language had the language had to be uh, you know uh, uh, used the language had to be interpreted by the local population there were these other ideas as mentioned here clearly which is it was shown as if english and an english education would help the native to shape character okay if one was seen as or one was told that one was superstitious, one was you know, um, one was in darkness and in need of enlightenment. It also showed that uh, this, the, 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 the portraiture was such that you know, English, an English in education would help you to, sh to shape your character, okay, your personality. Also then it, it will help you develop the aesthetic sense, they help you, uh, uh, you know, um, understand it help you un understand the beautiful, the sublime and the good for instance. Okay. Further the disciplines of ethical thinking that it also make you an ethical person. So, if this was the projection, it was uh, quite readily taken in by many from the educated middle class. So, English was sought uh, to be as even it is today, English was sought to be uh, sort of the passport okay, to a higher development of oneself and a higher moral and aesthetic uh, you know, uh, um, ideal that one should, uh, one should aim at. Okay? Then she says the tension between increasing involvement in Indian education and enforced non-interference in religion was productively resolved through the introduction of English literature. Okay? Significantly, the direction to this solution was present in the charter itself, one of whose section empowered the governor general in council to direct that a sum of not less than 1 lakh of rupees shall be annually applied to the revival and improvement, this is the revival and improvement of the teaching 
of English literature in India and to the encouragement of the learned natives of India. Okay. Uh, those of you who are in literary studies would also know that one of, uh, one of the uh, opinions of, uh, of writers is that literature is one, a literary text is one which you read not just for pleasure. Okay. A uh, good literary text is supposed to also give you certain values, right? And through the the, the through the certain positive characters characteristics, for instance, of say the protagonist, for instance, or certain undesirable traits in, for instance, um, again the in certain undesirable uh, qualities in the villain, for instance. So these literary texts are not just texts from which you learn the language or which you just enjoy reading. Okay? You also inculcate and many studies in um, you know in cognitive uh, studies of literary perception also do reveal that, okay? that a reader is sometimes or uh, sometimes finds herself okay, emulating the characteristics. So, what better way to sort of tutor the Indian mind uh, uh, you know uh, in, in the certain ideals. Okay? Uh, than to introduce English literary text. This is one of the reasons as we uh, uh, you know as we mentioned earlier uh, in mentioned earlier ago why English literature as a discipline came in the colonies first rather than in the mother country. Then Vishwanathan says increasingly there was less patience with the policy of conciliation. The initial wave of euphoria over the literary treasures of India rapturously described as so new, so fresh, so original. So, unlike all the antiquated types <laughs> and models of the West, uh, with which the mind was aroused and enraptured, had by the 1820s give, given way to caustic criticisms of his systems of learning. Minto's minute, this is, this is talking about an earlier history, minute of 1813 favoring the revival of oriental learning was harshly criticized for may not making the slightest effort to introduce in whole or part by implantation or engraftment the improved literature and science of Europe, embodying as these do all that is magnificent in discovery, ennobling and in truth and elevating in sentiment. Okay. So, it seems that when like in many cases, when the British first came in contact with the literatures of uh, literatures of the Orient, say literature in India, they they obviously they you know they found such literature exotic. Okay, they found the many differences in ideals, the many differences in the way of expression as as something that was very very um, appealing in, uh, at first. Okay, so this very appeal. Uh, of the Indian text to the to the British was was later on discouraged, and these texts were shown to be inferior to to Western texts. Okay, uh, not perhaps only because they really saw it as inferior, but also because it was at odds with the policy of introducing English. Okay, so we I will end this lecture by again coming back to Professor Braj Kachru and referring back again to our lecture on the alchemy of English. Okay. Um, if this has been a history, the a history of English in India has been a history of political management, okay, of hegemony as we saw through Gauri Vishwanathan, of hegemonic impulses not by coercion, but by the creation and manufacture of consent. What is its status today. Okay. Uh, the status today as we saw in the lecture on the alchemy of English is that it is, is really a that English has created a you know a new caste if you may use the word here by analogy. English has created a new caste of people who in India who, who are enjoying the fruits of 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 uh, a modern technological world. Okay. On the other hand, the language by its sheer attitudinal neutrality okay, can also erase certain markers of oppression of inequality. For instance, certain markers of caste that are present in Indian languages are not there in English. Okay. So, English can be a great leveler today in India. Okay. And, and at, at the same time as it also creates a particular a very very privileged class or as Krachu says a caste of people right, 
or who bear, uh, who enjoy the fruits of liberalization and modernization. So, the alchemy of in the alchemy of English if you recall Kachuret said that competence in English and the use of this language signify a transmutation like alchemy and added potential and added potential for material and social gain and advantage which is really available to uh, let us uh, you know fa face it okay, as Kachuret says available to a very few. Knowing English is like possessing the fabled Aladdin's lamp, which permits one to open as it were the linguistic gates to international business, technology, science and travel and this is precisely what is happening in India today. Even as we speak right now, the percentage of population in of the population total population in India that knows English and reaps the benefits of knowing English is enormously low. Okay. So, this has created a disparity um, you know, uh, among the population itself. Okay. So, this is something that we need to uh, even as we, we celebrate okay, the, uh, you know, the, the use and the great potential of the language okay, to take us very far particularly in the international scenario, we have to understand the other side as well. Okay. This also Kachru says has created as we saw in, uh, in that lecture created a sort of linguistic schizophrenia. Okay. What is this linguistic schizophrenia that is still present in contemporary India that he talks about is that in, in anti English circles we find surprisingly that there is one policy inside the home and another outside. This is linguistic schizophrenia in case of English. You will often find as Kachu said many uh, even policy makers or many uh, you know public figures in, in, their, in their public speeches talking about the need okay, for us to learn in the vernacular language okay, to send our children to, to schools where the medium of, of instruction is in the native language. But on the other hand. Uh, if it is to be believed so, these very personalities uh, do not hesitate to send their own children okay, as Kachu puts it to uh, English medium schools or to places of higher education in the European or American world or okay, you know, the, the western world in general. So, there is also this kind of linguistic split in the country. So, the this has created as he says a new cast of English using speech fellowships across cultures and usage, a shift of power from the traditional class structures of India to and a new caste has, has developed an important social change giving users power for mobility and social advancement. Fine. And I would like to end this um, discussion today uh, by referring to the uh, to a well known writer named Raja Rao the author of the famous Kanthapura, who says that as long as the English language is universal it will always remain Indian. We shall have the English language with us and amongst us and not as our guest or our friend, but as one of as he says as one of our own of our caste, our creed, our sect and our tradition. This obviously would again take, take us back to uh, you know to a lecture like uh, uh, world Englishes for instance, okay, where we have our own variant of English. English is here as Ajara says in our country no, no longer as a guest, no longer as a hitherto colonial tool of masked exploitation and commercial uh, administrative advantages. Okay. English has been Indianized as many would say English has been Indianized and we say, see this in the many uh, you know creative and linguistic so to speak um, um, experimentation that has been done by poets writing uh, in India writing in English by novelists as I said I mentioned earlier Arundhati Roy for instance in the God of Small Things and many other writers who have created a specific kind of English which is no longer English English, but is Indian English. Okay? And thank you for being with us, see you in the next module, thank you.